CRISPR has absolutely revolutionized the medical world. It is curing genetic diseases, once thought incurable, is a potential treatment for cancer, and is even helping to spot, stop the spread of diseases like malaria. But in all truthfulness, I know very little about the medical field. I've actually had a fainting problem since I was a child, so anything like somewhat related to a doctor, I try to avoid. It's bad. But I do know a lot about food, and I think it's only time before CRISPR starts to totally transform our food supply as we know it. And spoiler alert, there's already one food product that's been CRISPR edited on the market. Honestly, so many different ways CRISPR could be used to enhance our food supply, but today I'm going to talk about four different areas. But first, I thought let's just do a quick review of what CRISPR is in case you don't know. I guess if you do know, then just skip ahead 30 seconds or so. I like to think of CRISPR like the find and replace tool on Microsoft Word. You know, like if you're writing up a report and you want to always replace an old word, with the new word, you can use the find and replace tool. CRISPR is very similar, except obviously it's working with genetic sequences. So what CRISPR can do is it can find a certain area of the genetic code, either cut it out or repair it with a new genetic code. So in this way, it finds the code and replaces it with something new. Usually it enhances or corrects that genetic sequence. And the reason CRISPR has really blown up in the science world is that it's fast, it's precise, and affordable. Three very important things. Let's get to the first category of CRISPR edited foods that I think are coming your way. And this is nutrient boosted foods using CRISPR. And remember I said earlier in the introduction that one of these foods is actually already on the market. The product is called Conscious Greens, made by the Conscious Food Company and released this year, or 2023. And what they did, I think was pretty smart. So this is a mixed green salad of purple and green mustard leaves. Now, these leaves are said to have the same nutrition, say as like dark leafy greens, like spinach and kale, like the healthy ones, but also have that bite or crunch that you get from like iceberg or romaine. So it's really the best of both worlds, which I can relate to because my boyfriend and I are trying to eat salads right now. But like with spinach, you just lack that crunchy mouthfeel. What the Conscious Foods Company did is they found a distant relative of commercial kale. And this relative has the same nutrition of kale, like the high antioxidants, all that good stuff, but it also has the leaf pattern more similar to iceberg lettuce, meaning that it's a crispy and fresh and crunchy. Then they used CRISPR to silence the gene that was uh, responsible for that like bad pungency. And now what do we have is the conscious greens mixture, which is both crispy and crunchy, but also has the same nutrition as like kale and spinach. Pretty cool. And there's one other example of nutrient boosted foods that you might be interested in hearing about. And that's because it has to do with protein and who is not trying to get more protein in their diet. The company Benson Hills has used CRISPR to edit soybean plants to have 20% more protein compared to the commercial variety. The company is now looking at yellow pea plants to also increase that protein content. Making these protein pumped soybeans was no easy feat. Benson Hills said they looked at over 20,000 different varieties of soybeans, looked through the genomes to see which soybeans produced the highest amount of protein, and looked to see what similarities or differences there were in the genome compared back to what we use commercially for soybeans. But what I think is really interesting about getting the same crop with a higher amount of protein is that it can have huge downstream effects during processing. So we can get the same amount of protein using less water for processing and cleaning and all the equipment. We could also probably save some carbon dioxide equivalents by having to do less processing 
to get that certain amount of protein. So this is about more than just making more nutritious food. It's about all the other benefits that might happen at the same time, like using less resources and less energy. Hi everyone, I just wanted to remind you if you're getting value from this video, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe to my channel, or share my channel with a family member or friend, and here's my cute dog. If you're allergic to food, you'll want to listen up now because the next category I want to talk about is saying goodbye to food allergies. If you've watched my previous video that talks all about the basics of a food allergy, you know that food allergies are really caused by the protein in food. It's not the whole food itself. It's the protein that triggers the immune system. So this has got me thinking, right? CRISPR could alter, change, or modify that protein that causes the allergic reaction. Actually, it only has to modify the epitope, the part of the protein, that is responsible for the allergic reaction. In theory, I think this sounds very straightforward, but in reality, it might be more challenging. And that's because if we modify the protein so that it doesn't cause a food allergy, we don't know what kind of effects that change may have on different parts of the food. So it's, it's hard to predict how changing one thing might change a whole slew of other things. For example, if uh, we take uh, milk allergies, which are quite prevalent, it's one of the big A allergens in the US. So say we want to alter one of the proteins in milk that causes an allergic reaction in humans. We just can't quite predict maybe how modifying that protein may impact the cow and the cow's health and how the cow makes that milk to begin with. So I fear it's not gonna be that easy but again, we have 160 different shots at this because there's so many food allergens. In a similar vein, scientists in the US and Spain are working together to make a new variety of wheat that has reduced allergenicity for people with celiac disease. Now, celiac disease is triggered by the protein in wheat. That protein is called gluten, is the broad name, but the specific protein these researchers are trying to reduce is called alpha-gliadin. And the researchers have seen some pretty good results with this wheat they've created. When they fed it to people with celiac disease, they saw that that was an 85% reduction in immune response. And that's pretty major. Moving on to the next category. Please tell me what is the worst fruit to include in a smoothie? Like what fruit makes or breaks a smoothie? I'll give you one second and then I'm gonna tell you the real answer. Type it in the comments, worst fruit. The worst fruit, according to me, is blackberries. I cannot stand those little seeds in my smoothie, that like gritty little crunch getting stuck in my teeth. And this brings us to the next category of seedless fruits. As far as I can remember, my whole life, I've been eating seedless watermelon and seedless grapes. So I don't quite understand why we haven't kept this trend up. But now with CRISPR, getting seedless fruits might be even easier. And the Conscious Foods Company, remember that company we talked about earlier that made the salad greens mix? They next want to get into seedless fresh produce. And to my delight, the first fruit that Conscious Foods wants to sort of tackle is blackberries. And after that, they still have plans to look at black raspberries and red raspberries. So we'll see how they do in the next couple of years. And I don't see why this type of research can't be extended into pitted fruits. You know, can we get rid of the pitted cherries, plums, peaches? What about that pit and avocados? I mean, if that avocado was all green flesh and none of that huge pit, this millennial and all my other millennials, we would be on cloud nine. All right last category and that is flavor which is so important when it comes to food let's talk about decaf coffee which i don't know if you'll believe this i do not drink decaf i love caffeine but i have heard that decaf coffee tastes horribly it's bland it doesn't have any flavor to it like regular coffee and there's a reason for this 
and that's because to decaffeinate the coffee beans, they need to be soaked in a solvent, which pulls out the caffeine, and unfortunately also pulls out a lot of other similar molecules, which are flavors and aromas. This is why your decaf coffee never tastes quite right. But the good news is there is a company in the UK called Tropic Biosciences, and they are using CRISPR to make coffee beans that have low to no caffeine in them. So this means those coffee beans never even have to go through that decaffeination process and would, you know, naturally be more flavorful and uh, have those good aromatics still. One other area of flavor research has to do with tomatoes. And I've had some pretty bad tomatoes in my life. Like you bite into it, but it tastes like nothing. The problem with most of our current fruits and vegetables is that for decades, they have been bred to have increased disease resistance and higher yields and having perfect zero blemishes. But do you see anything missing here? It's flavor. I do have some good news about those, you know, tasteless tomatoes. And a group of geneticists have looked at heirloom tomatoes versus our commercial tomatoes and identified 13 different compounds very important to the flavor of the heirloom tomatoes. Now using CRISPR, we could get these flavors back into our commercial tomatoes so that they finally taste like something again. Perhaps an even more interesting research project about tomatoes is that a different research group is currently trying to make the first spicy tomato. This research group says that they found tomatoes actually have most of the genes to make the spicy compound in peppers called capsaicin. They claim they only have to make a couple of little tweaks to these genes and are hopeful to make the first spicy tomato. No doubt there's a ton more projects looking at how CRISPR can be used for the food supply that I've highlighted here. But I'm curious to hear from you. Do you have any ideas of how to use this technology in the food supply? Or maybe you're a bit scared to have this technology used on food. Let me know in the comments and I look forward to hearing from you.